So we've got back-to-back uh, -back presentations from the folks at the Army Corps of Engineers Coastal and Hydraulics Laboratory in Vicksburg, Mississippi. And Chris Keyes is going to lead off talking about, uh, as I understand it, a software distribution uh, system similar to what we do with Sage. Thanks. Okay, well, thanks uh, everybody, especially William, for having us. Uh, so I'm going to talk about HashDisk. It's an open source tool. You can go and look at the uh, HashDisk organization on GitHub. And, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of try to do a little bit of a demo and, and show you the way things are laid out towards the end of the talk. Uh, so the, uh, after a lot of acknowledgments, I want to thank especially the, uh, basically the lead developers on this who have been scattered all over the place. Doug Sfera Seljabotten at uh, University of Oslo. Uh, he kind of took the lead on the first prototype. Andre Chertik, who's um, at Los Alamos now, uh, worked on it um, through the University of Texas. Um, and Aaron Amadia, who uh, started in our postdoc program, uh, or our research participation program, and now is a, a full-time uh, staff member at, at our laboratory, uh, has kind of taken over the maintenance and the development over the last year or so. Uh, and then we have a number of other uh, contributors who were just, uh, you know, doing it on their own time or, or using it for their projects in their various different places. Uh, the funding for this has been kind of sporadic, and we've, we've tried to fund it out of projects that have a need for distribution, but we don't have any projects explicitly supporting uh, software distribution. Uh, hopefully that will change, but uh, for now we've just been able to fund little bits and pieces. Uh, but we have a, you know, at this point, I think we're officially maybe at 0 0.2, really we're at 0 0.3, and we're using it uh, every day for, you know, pretty large projects. Uh, I don't think we have anything that has as many packages as Sage. How many packages does the standard Sage distribution have in it? 70 or 80, maybe? Okay. Around 100. Yeah. We're, we're, we're probably not even at half that many packages, but uh, still at, you know, over... 25 or 30 and, and can be very difficult packages to build and I'll explain a little bit more about that. Okay, so what's the problem? Uh, you know, this is kind of very much in keeping I think with the general SAGE ideas. Like we, you know, we're, we're writing mathematical software or engineering analysis software and, you know, we're writing it for customers and we're writing it for the public. You know, we want people to use it. Uh, and so we, the problem is, uh, you know, how do we get it out there so that you can use it? So what are the problems that arise? Now, first of all, you have dependencies. Uh, so say you need LibFoo and you don't have it on your machine, uh, and you know, you've, got, you've got to provide some way to build that. Another problem that's not quite so obvious but arises especially on high-performance computing platforms is that, uh, yeah, you know, my software needs to LibFoo, but uh, on your platform, you need to use somebody else's LibFoo. So I can't bundle everything under the sun in my distribution and force you to use it on your different machines. You've got to use a vendor supplied library for whatever that is. And that problem ends up, uh, as we'll see, sort of breaking the paradigm for a lot of the package management systems. Uh, but it's something that we had to address because our, one of our explicit goals was supporting uh, you know, uh, engineering and mathematical environments on high performance computers. Uh, of course, there's the platform independence problem. I built my stuff on Linux, and, but you need to run it on OS X. Uh, yeah, you need to run it on HPC, HPC machines. Uh, that can be a major problem. And it kind of makes me sick when I see, you know, research funding, and then a whole huge fraction of that is going to porting something to an HPC machine, right? That, to me, is almost a total sink because most of that knowledge on building on that machine is very much, it's going to expire in another year or two, and you're going to have to do a whole new set of stuff, you know. So this porting problem to HPC is something that we really want to make, we want to limit the amount of time and resources that go into that. Another big problem uh, that we get more and more is that you don't have root access on your machine. This problem happens on HPC machines. Uh, in a sense, I guess it happens on Sage Math Cloud, right? You're on an instance there, and, and you really, uh, you know, for security reasons, you can't allow root access to those uh, images. Uh, and in the Army, uh, as security problem, you know, the solution to the security problems is take away more and more freedom from your scientists, right? 
And so we're getting more and more to the point where, you know, actually I just got an email uh, yesterday that this machine is going to be locked out for the rest of the summer because I haven't installed the back door so that the administrators can go in and mess with it. Uh, so, uh, so this is, you know, this kind of stuff is going away. We've got to deal with that um, problem with, if we're going to address the distribution problem. Uh, so we need to add software to a distribution system, but it needs to be able to handle all of those problems. And that's really what motivated uh, the development of HashDist. Uh, and I don't have a slide for this, but a little bit of the history on this is, uh, you know, uh, well, I, actually I do have a slide on this. Well, this, this started uh, partly from kind of me trying to reproduce I have a distribution system that I had built into my software called Proteus, which is this open source PDE software package. Uh, but as soon as just I kind of started looking for people to solve this problem, it became a kind of a community discussion. Uh, and it was very apparent that the state of scientific software distribution, especially in Python, was, uh, was very bad. Uh, and we needed to, to try to come up with a, a community solution. Uh, so here's here are the kind of distribution options or solutions that we have out there, at least in 2013, um, mostly the same state in now in 2014. So we have these type of Linux distributions, Debian or Red Hat. They work really well uh, when you control the whole machine and you want to stay on Linux. Then you have things like you know app stores where you have you know people providing a framework for you to put your stuff into, uh, and that can work if you like to you know if you're okay with kind of being in that straight jacket. Uh, we have web applications, which is, I think it is really a brilliant solution in a lot of ways, what you're doing with Sage and Sage Math Cloud, uh, solving the distribution problem just by making it available over the web so that people don't even have to install the software. And we're completely behind that, uh, but that does sit on top of the distribution, so you, you still have to deal with the distribution problem there. Uh, <clears throat> MATLAB another kind of distribution, another kind of environment, uh, and we still struggle with that argument internally. Uh, and I'm, I've heard even worse stories happening at universities where you have your MATLAB folks that are kind of actively waging war on the Python guys or whatever because, you know, it, it, it really, in uh, some ways, these, these things are not compatible. And it, if we want to make sure that we can all share our stuff, you know, one solution is you commit to an environment you know, and every, force everybody to use that. And in the Army, we have a lot of folks that use MATLAB productively and understandably they, you know, are concerned about other approaches. Uh, but I think, I won't talk about it in this talk, I think there are actually solutions to that that we can come up with as well. Uh, HPC machines often use a system of modules where you, uh, you know, you can provide multiple versions of a package. Uh, I don't particularly like that solution. Uh, primarily because I don't have access to it. You know, half my software is development software, and I don't, I can't go and build modules for that and share them with my users on, on HPC machines. Again, a little more background. The Subrodia is a toolkit for PDEs, uh, and you know, at some point we had to start addressing this issue of how we would let other people use that, and we had to start building our own software stack, which included, you know. 10 to 20 packages, many of which were very difficult to build. Uh, Phoenix is another toolkit for PDEs. Uh, and it, they ended up building their own system, which is called Dorsal, their own sort of package management system. Uh, when we started discussing this within the DOD at the High Performance Computing Conference that, uh, that was in Portland several years ago, we had a birds of a feather session. and suddenly we realized there were five different Python distributions sitting in the room from DOD centers, and they were all telling the same story. We don't have any funding to support this. It's taken up a huge amount of time maintaining this distribution, uh, but we need it. You know, How can we somehow get rid of the duplication of effort here on these different scientific Python distributions? Uh, now, uh, a, a solution that we could have taken at some point would have been to uh, possibly just use the Sage package man management system or the system or the Inthal systems. Uh, I don't remember the thinking that went through my head when I decided to start writing my own make files and scripts to, to distribute packages for Proteus. Uh, 
that particularly not on the sage side, uh, it may have been that I know that I needed to explicitly support a bunch of different platforms and I knew the focus in Sage was really for Linux, which I think is reasonable. Uh, the InThought side, you know, I did talk to the InThought guys and it, it was clear to me that, you know, they're a business and there's no interest in their business model at supporting HPC systems, right? There's no, they're not enough users to, for them to make money off of that and it's a very hard problem uh, and so there, there wasn't going to be much help building on top of like an InThought distribution. Uh, so, uh, again, the state several years ago was that I had my own set of scripts uh, to build the Proteus distribution or stack. Uh, several other DoD folks had their own. Uh, so we started talking about, you know, fixing this problem and, and coming together and building something that we could all use. Uh, and these are some of the requirements that we came up with for that. So number one, it has to support mixing source and host packages. Okay, so a host package would be something that might look like a package specification where you might go say, I want to build open blobs or I want to build a pack, but instead what you do is say, I want to use this one from the system because it's the one that Cray has supplied and I need to use that. But we needed explicit support for that rather than just kind of using that in a, in a hackish way through the back door. Uh, and again, that's something that's not really of interest, say, on Linux distributions or uh, like with Inthal or something like that, because they can control the entire distribution, uh, whereas we can't do that on HPC systems. Uh, it had to support version control and reproducibility across users. Uh, so we need to be able to share this. Uh, different users need to be able to share their stacks, version their stacks, and, and incrementally change their software stacks. Uh, another huge thing, and this comes mainly from the HPC side, is that it can't just be a Python distribution. I mean, it was very clear early on that what we were building in Proteus the Python pro packaging wasn't the problem. The problem was the other stuff, the C++, the Fortran uh, libraries, and getting all the others to work nicely together. Uh, so really, you have to solve the problem of scientific packaging in general. You can't just solve it for Python. Uh, and again, similar to the version control issue, it's got to support the needs of developers. Uh, so. Uh, which is a subtle difference, I think, with some of these distribution systems like with Linux. I mean, you, there you really have system admins, you have uh, sort of packaging folks, and that's what they do. But for our side, we really need, we need sort of a, an overlap between those two things. This has got to be a system that works nicely for the guys who are actually writing the new algorithms or implementing the new algorithms. So it needs more seamless integration with, with actual development workflows. And so instead of at the very end of your process, you pay somebody or you do the extra work to create a package out of it and ship that up. We need something that goes very quickly from a new git commit to a new package that you can display, that you can send to other people, maybe your co-developers. Okay, some other issues with scientific code. Um, and these are kind of all just pointing at contradictions, right? Dependencies are bad, they're hard to build, uh, they're hard to move between clusters, okay? so. You, go, you can go the old route of including all that stuff somehow in your own code, maybe even re-implementing stuff, um, you know, so that you've got sort of a monolithic, say, um, C++ or Fortran code. On the other hand, dependencies are good uh, because we can build on the work of others. And of course, this is a solution that we want to work towards. Uh, we really want to share code and we want to build on the things that others do rather than, than just uh, taking and re-implementing uh, in the long run, uh, doing that is not sustainable. <clears throat> so we often have these large frameworks. We have to bundle things together. Betsy and Trilinos are two examples of, uh, they're, they're basically parallel linear algebra systems that are geared towards solving PDEs. Uh, but both of those have uh, large numbers of, of sort of sub packages or, or modules. Uh, and they kind of have their own build systems, but uh, it's very dirty if you, if you start having to uh, move on top of that. Okay, so again, I'm, I'm repeating some things. What makes scientific code so special? No root access is a, is a big one. Uh, the, the fact that, you know, at some point, at any, any point, some fraction of your stack is leading edge development, right? You need the latest for, it, at the very least, your own stuff, but often several dependencies, you need their latest things too. Uh, for example, we're often 
you know, we're not IPython developers, but we're often building off of the master branch of IPython because we need new functionality there. Uh, so you need to be able to mix in development versions. Uh, again, in science, Fortran and C++ are still very, very important. Uh, and so some of the really nice package tools that are maybe just for a specific language like Java or, or even Python, they don't really help us. Uh, and I guess this is again a comment on the, the state of funding in, in science, especially HPC, is that we're at this intersection of uh, needing you know, fast code, we need rapid development, uh, and we can't afford to pay resources to dedicated system administrators. Okay, so that, that puts us in this situation of having to do a lot of these things ourselves. Another big thing is uh, what Dog called combinatorial explosion for packages. Uh, and again, you may not really see this so much, uh, you know, using apt-get or whatever you use for Linux, uh, because there you just say, you know, apt-get install HDF5 and you get one version there. You might be able to expose a development version or something like that. But if you look on an HPC machine, uh, what you'll see is a library like H HDF5, if you want to use the, the ones provided by the system, in, It'll, it'll be duplicated many, many times because you might have three different vendors, vendor uh, compilers on that machine. So you have PGI, Intel, maybe GNU. Uh, then, of course, you'd have different versions for the dependencies that go into making HDF5, which is MPI. So you have, for each compiler, you have several versions of MPI. So now you've got compilers times several versions of MPI. Uh, and then you've got other dependencies, okay? So you get a real combinatorial explosion there in the number of versions that you have. Uh, so you've got a lot of different dimensions uh, and they add up to a, a big mess when it comes to dealing uh, with management of your packages. So established options, again, uh, you can copy the approach used by Linux distributions on their package management, but typically you need root they don't deal well with the combinatorial explosion. They can deal with several different versions of a package, kind of a, a curated, stable version, a beta version, an old version maybe, but not the kind of explosion that you get on HPC machines. Mac ports and Fink, other solutions, Mac only, uh, still doesn't do well enough with combinatorial explosion. HPC environments, again, they have this module system, uh, but sysadmins hate them, we hate them, uh, not a good solution. Uh, and of course, our, our deal is that we're kind of on the edge of development and packaging, and so we can't, we have this combinatorial explosion even within our own development codes, and the module system's not helping us there. Okay, so again, back to current solutions. Build everything yourself from source. Okay, use an auto comp type system. Okay, you do that for a while and then you realize, well, I could do this a lot better if I wrote some scripts, okay, and wrote some of my own tools, okay. So this is the progression that happened with us. It happened with the Phoenix project at Simula. You end up writing your own thing that keeps moving more and more into actually supporting a distribution and supporting package tools for that distribution. Uh, and so this is a solution that we've seen in, in you know, our own work and, and others. So every, everybody does it eventually if you have a complicated enough set of dependencies. <clears throat> and it's actually, uh, you know, it's not that hard. So it's deceptive, I guess, is that you initially get into it thinking, I can do a pretty good job with this. And uh, one of my favorite co quotes is uh, from a very well-known scientific software package who's not in this room. And we were talking about this problem and, and the person said, uh, Oh yeah, we've got a great package management system. It's probably the best one out there. And I said, well, you know, I posted it somewhere. I said, hey, has anybody tried using this, this package management system? And uh, of course the answer came back, no, it's terrible, it never works for me, it's always broken, you know? And that's the thing, it works for you. It's great because you wrote it, but it doesn't work for anybody else, okay? Mm -hmm. And so, this is a problem that, that it's, it's kind of an inherent community problem. You know, we have to develop something that we can use together, that we develop together, so it's intuitive for all of us. Uh, and that's the only way it's going to actually work for all of us. Uh, the idea of, of adopting something 
if there was a magical tool out there that was great, like LaTeX or something like that for package distributions, then yeah, but so far uh, we haven't seen it. Uh, and there are always these subtle little de details about your particular requirements that maybe don't match up. Uh, okay, another thing that's important is curation. Uh, I mean, you do care when you're talking about a distribution about the quality of the packages that are included. Uh, and this is an important part of the whole kind of sociology of, of building distributions. Uh, again, we're in this situation where you can, there's always going to be some fraction that's either your own code or bleeding edge code that you have to, you know, th this distribution system can't be purely curated packages with a high barrier to entry. It's got to mix the two. Uh, and again, to repeat, the community uh, using and supporting the distribution to me is almost as important as a lot of the other details. I mean, when it comes down to it, you need people hammering away every day on whether this package built on that system and then feeding back when it doesn't work. Uh, it's very important uh, that you have that community. Okay, so now uh, I'll sort of stop with the philosophy and go into a little bit of the, the cash disk theory, and then I'll end with a, um, better hurry up, I'll end with, with a, a little tour of, a, of some hash disk uh, stuff on my machine. So uh, very quickly, this is kind of the fundamental idea. Uh, uh, there, there are two ways to look at, uh, well, there's some major paradigms in programming. One is stateful programming and one is functional programming. Uh, and often when we think about our software environment on a particular machine, uh, we think of something that is determined by the state of a file system. A file system, And that's because file systems are sort of naturally stateful, right? Uh, meaning libfoo is not some abstract uh, world of different versions of libfoo. It's the thing that lives in user lib or user local lib. And if I want to change libfoo, I need to change the thing that's in lib, user lib, libfoo, right? I change that thing's state. Uh, so that's the, the sort of the stateful view of your environment. Uh, and that's fine when you control everything and you don't need a lot of modularity and you don't have to deal with that combinatorial explosion. So it works really well when you can lock things down and just control the environment. Uh, but another way to look at this, uh, and I tried to, since we're here mainly we're talking about Sage and, and we've got a room full of mathematicians, I, I messed around with some, <laughs> some mapping stuff here. So. Uh, I never get to use direct sum symbols anymore. So, <laughs> uh, so one way to look at, at the process of building is as a mapping. Okay, so we have our input states, so it's our domain, and that contains the dependencies, so your upstream software dependencies, your sources, and then the recipes for building those sources. Okay, those are the input variables, your, your coordinates in your high dimensional space of inputs to the build. Then the build is really a mapping from a particular point in that domain to a range, which is a bunch of different libfoo.a states, okay? Uh, and that's the functional view of building packages, okay? It's a, it's a function from inputs to, out, to outputs, and those outputs effectively should be unique things that live in, in the abstract range of your mapping. Uh, so the main idea of hash disk is <coughs> How do we come up with, is basically build coordinates for that output space. Uh, and we do that by building, by hashing um, our input states. So hash the dependencies, the sources, and the recipes, and come up with a unique identifier for the result of that build. Okay, so those are, that hash of the inputs is actually sort of the coordinates of the build in your range of your build mapping. Okay, and we call those, the results of the build, build artifacts. So every time you change something, you get a new build artifact of libfoo.a. And it's, you locate that thing using a hash. Okay, this is the case, it's a SHA-1 hash, a cryptographic hash of the inputs. Uh, and so if we do this, then we can, we can treat package management and building packages in a functional manner rather than a stateful manner. And this comes from a, a, a PhD thesis by Ilko Delstra. Uh, in the Netherlands, and he actually implemented this system in the Nix OS and the Nix package manager. So this is not something that we came up with, uh, but Dog in particular sort of identified this as, as something that's an inherent problem, especially in the HPC side of things where we had this combinatorial explosion. Uh, so, so switching from the stateful view where you have 
you have to start dealing with this directory tree that keeps expanding and you have to come up with more and more complicated names for the different uh, combinations, just hash it, okay? And then you can support all of the possible changes, okay? All right, I'm gonna skip over this. Uh, you've probably seen stuff about uh, SHA-1 hashes and how they work. Uh, basic idea is here you have uh, some text, okay? So most of our, our inputs to the build, our source code options, they're all text. We can hash that. Uh, we come up with, a, with a, a key. If we change it just a little bit, that key changes, okay? So if the sources change, the options change, uh, or the upstream dependencies change, then the key to our, uh, our build artifact changes. And of course, this is not, this is being used in lots of other places too. Uh, ignore the fact that this is hash disk. The point, you know, in your Git repositories, you know, you're using this idea, to, um, you know, going away from just having an incremental number to having a, a hash, right? In Git, each commit is, is identified by a SHA-1 hash. That's why it works in a distributed sense, because we're not having to increment some centralized database, we're just hashing it, okay? So Git uses this idea to some extent to, 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 uh, to build up the database of different versions of a, of a source code uh, project. Okay. So let's look at, at the, the hash base installation. So the first version would be what's happening on your Linux laptop, user lib, lib HDF5. There's one HDF5 there. Go to HPC system, you would have a modules directory that would have all the different versions of HDF5 that represent some of these combinations. But again, even that's, and if you try to encode all that information into the HDF5, the compiler, the Python version that it used, the NumPy version that it used, uh, that's still incomplete with respect to all the different changes that you could make for, in this case, the H5Pi module. Uh, this was an example that Dog pulled from one of their clusters. The Army clusters, uh, especially the ones that have been around for a year or two, it's even worse. We're talking 20 to 30 different versions of HDF5 uh, to choose from. But, you know, thankfully, this, this, this hashing idea sort of takes care of it. It's uglier, you know, in a sense. But it, it's a more general solution in the long run. It's, it's, it, it solves the problem for us. Okay, this is actually just a snippet. This is an internal thing. It's not something that you would ever write. But I'm trying to show here, you know, the steps in the build process. This is that initial process of hashing the inputs. So the the domain of the build mapping. Uh, Essentially, your, your, your particular set of input variables comes in through a build script, uh, some, some upstream uh, dependencies. So here's Zlib and the particular uh, build of Zlib that you depend on. And then here's your sources for HDF5. In this case, you're going to say, go get the HDF5 from a tar.bz2 file. You'd have given it a URL, but that's not relevant to the patch because we don't care where you got it from. We care does this, does the source hash match the source that you're building from. Uh, so this could be git and a git commit ID. We'll talk about that later. But but that's this is the thing that you that uh, you used to build the hash. And then you 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 do the build and now you start to get uh, populating this. This is sort of your range of your build for each package. So in this case, I've got a package named ADH. I've got two hashes of it because I've built two versions. Bzip only has one, Cython has two. Uh, and then if you look inside one of those directories, you see the stuff that would get installed in a stateful file system, say a user local or something like that. But the actual versions of that stuff get stored in these uh, hash directory paths. This build thing is essentially a database. It's a database of all the packages that you've built and all the versions of those packages. Uh, and that's where the, the concrete place where those things live. Uh, if you look at some, you know, you use a tool to look at the linkage of some of those packages. So in this case, we're looking at how libhdf5.so uh, got built, uh, you know, what it's linked to. In some cases, you see that it's linking to system libraries, okay, and that's because Again, we have to support this case where we don't build everything. Some things go to the system because you have to go to the system for them. But a lot of the other ones don't. MPI is part of our distribution in this particular case. And you see that HDF5 is pointing to 
another build artifact. Okay. Uh, and then the final step is, of course, we all have we all have to go back to living in the stateful world where we have a, a directory like user local where all of our stuff is. Okay. And so in this case, these are called profiles in, in hash disk, uh, and they get hashed as well. And so in this case, we've got a profile, the hashes, YC, et cetera. And if we look in the bin directory, we see a bunch of tools that would normally live, say, in user local bin, but now they live in that particular profile. Now you can link that to user local bin, and you can use it as your user local bin, okay? And that's the way we do a lot of our development. Uh, if you, if, for example, if you use virtual in for something like that, where you create something that's a, effectively a prefix directory uh, that you can then install into freely, that's, that's what you can do with these profiles. <clears throat> okay, now getting into to how you actually use it a little bit. Uh, so the, the, the hit tool, so the hash just command line tool is called hit, H-I-T, which is to kind of remind you that it's somewhat like git, uh, is the, uh, you use that to, to build your packages and build entire distributions or profiles. Uh, and the way, main thing that it would be looking for would be, in this case, this default.yaml file, uh, which has the, all the packages that you want to build for your profile. So if you type hit build, it's going to say, okay, I'm going to use the default profile that's in my directory where I'm working right now and it's going to go and build all the packages that that profile specifies. And that might take some time because it's got to build everything from scratch the first time around. Uh, next time you type hit build, it looks at the profile, it looks at all the packages and the hashes, and it says they're all there. Okay, so it doesn't rebuild. They're all there and they're all up to date. <clears throat> now in terms of, again, sharing and working with somebody else, you might say, now I want to, I want to, fetch somebody else's repository, I want to check out their branch, which is going to change default.yaml, maybe add some new packages, or it might change some of the sources, and I do hit build again, and now that might take a few seconds, because they may have said, you need to update your IPython, and so it, it's going to check to see if I have built the version of IPython that has been specified, if I haven't, it goes and builds it. And again, uh, you know, this, this block is talking about sharing, but this block is talking about something that's extremely important for science, which is reproducibility. Uh, because to run my algorithm that I implemented, you need to be able to reproduce my environment. Okay, and if that environment is under version control, then you can just say, okay, go get check out the paper from 2010. That's got everything specified in, in my YAML uh, specifications. You hit build, that gives me their environment. I can run it. It hasn't installed over my environment. It's just populated that build cache with the stuff that I need and created a profile that I can then run their, their um, algorithm in. So again, hurrying up so I can get to the, uh, give Kevin some time. The, uh, again, the main thing about the hash is it gives us way more dimensions, okay? Uh, we don't have to spend our time trying to come up with names that specify all of the different uh, dimensions that go into building a version of a package. Some things that you get for free are atomic upgrades, okay, because we're not changing the state of the system. We're, we're, we're building stuff in a, in, a, in a kind of database, okay, so if that fails, right, you just start it off again, okay, it's not going to corrupt your system. So upgrades are atomic, uninstalls are easy, uh, changing between profiles are easy. <clears throat> And again, jumping back and forth in the software is, is easy, especially going backwards, okay, because it's all still there in the database. And again, it's not, that's not bragging. That's actually sort of Dolster's idea of bearing fruit in the long run. It's, it's not, the implementation is not that complicated. Okay, so let me do a, a very quick demo just to kind of give you a feel for the way it looks. Uh, not that it looks all that nice, but... Uh, <laughs> Okay, so here's my hash disk directory for, for this Linux machine. Uh, and I'm not going to go into to all of these things. But there is a config.yaml file that can, it's not something that you necessarily want to put under version control, but it helps things, uh, helps you kind of 
explain that you could change, you could customize the layout of your of your hash disk um, directory so if you wanted to. But what's more important here is you can do some things uh, with your sources. Okay, so by default, and I'll show you this in a second, a package description is going to say ipython.yaml. This is where to go get ipython. Go to the GitHub repository. Get this particular commit. This is how you build it, okay? But you can also override that going to the GitHub to get it, and you can just go to a source cache, okay? So internally at our lab, we've got uh, a source cache that has all of the sources that are that the build bot on that machine is building nightly, okay? And they're all there in that cache. And so in that case, if you're locally inside our network and you change your, your config file to point to this URL, it's going to go there to grab the sources, okay? And remember, it's got a hash, and so it can verify that it is the source that's specified in the package definition. And these can be uh, nested or ordered. Um, so again, the, the idea is that the, the person who writes the package description, they tell you where to go for the canonical version of that, but you can then configure it to use a source cache. Uh, something that's in progress sitting in a pull request is to actually use a build cache as well. All right, these, these two directories have very similar structures. They're all hash directories. And so you can share your build cache as well. So first I'll show you the source cache that's on my machine. This is the stuff that I've already downloaded. So you see a bunch of package names. Uh, Let me skip that for a second. The source cache directory that you share is basically this uh, directory. Uh, and some of those things are actually explicit Git repositories. So they've got the whole repository in there. If it's just a tar file, you might just have the version that we've checked out. Uh, so back in the root directory, let me show you the build cache. Again, this is this, uh, you know, you see the different packages that I happen to have built on this machine. Uh, for various software stacks. And then if you look in a particular directory, you see these hashes. And these hashes have been truncated, but just, you know, it's, you can think of them as the full SHA-1 hash. Uh, so those are the different versions of IPython that I've built there. Those are those build hashes, not the source hashes. The source hashes happen on the source side. These are the coordinates to the different packages that you know, live in that range of the build operation. 